My name is Olin Berthold. I have about 430 hours of flight time and I'm a commercial multi-engine instrument pilot. On uh, December 12th, 2014, I was asked to do a post-maintenance test flight on a Cessna T-182T uh, to return it to service. I'm Ian Grossman. I'm a uh, commercial single-engine land uh, pilot with a instrument rating. Um, same day, I was asked to join Olin on the uh, maintenance flight. When I showed up at the airport, um, to meet up with Ian. Uh, I picked up the airplane from the mechanic and uh, he sort of took me out, showed me a new uh, engine start procedure and talked to me about a lot of the things that um, he sort of corrected or updated on the airplane. Um, talked to me about a mag issue, talked to me about um, the re-rigging of the flight controls, um, which turned out to be important later. Um, talk to me about uh, recentering the trims, changing the oil, um, all of the above, updating uh, some of the databases and whatnot. The takeoff seemed very normal. I rotated. Um, I wasn't trimming yet, you know, when I was low to the ground, I was just hand flying. And uh, I think maybe I trimmed a little bit, just slightly, put in a couple of uh, trim inputs, and then when we got to about six or eight hundred feet and I started to lead my level off, um, the nose really started to, to pull uh, toward the ground. So I looked over at him and, and noticed a little bit of a struggle. Um, so I asked what's wrong and he's like, hey, you know, I, I can't really, I'm feeling, you know, this, this doesn't feel right to me. It's feeling a lot of resistance right now. Um, so, you know, I'm like, well, how can I help? Like, you know, what do you need me to do? Do you want me to do, declare an emergency? And, uh, you know, we're just sort of our, the training we've gotten at school right now is kind of, you know, is uh, let's back each other up. Like he's already flying the plane and, you know, whatever I can do to help you, I, I want to keep, you know, keep me in the loop and uh, you know what it's feeling like, just tell me what you need me to do. Um, I said, hey man, I'm having a hard time hanging on to it. Can you get on the controls with me? And uh, just like you were saying, our training is to back each other up, CRM. Um, he got on the controls and we're kind of, the wheels are turning, we're kind of trying to figure out what to do. And um, I thought that, my first thought was my elevator is damaged. And so, uh, and I think your thought process was along the same lines. Um, and he asked me, hey, what, what do you want to do? Do you want me to go ahead and declare an emergency? And um, you know, as non-flying pilot, he's radios and checklists. I said, yeah, let's go ahead and declare an emergency. And meanwhile, as he's on the controls with me and we are, you know, leveling off for our downwind and, and starting to think about how we're going to get back to runway one, two, right, the long runway, um, my brain is saying, all right, you need to trim nose up because you're getting this nose down for us. And so I'm incrementally trimming nose up. And um, the question that, that every pilot has that has talked to me about this is, well, you were trimming nose up and it was getting worse. Why didn't that immediately set off an alarm bell? And the truth of it is, is that we're both hanging on to it. And um, the fact of the matter is that you can't necessarily feel the small inputs. And as the airspeed's increasing and all these other factors are changing, all we feel is the nose down tendency getting, getting worse. harder and harder. It took both of us to hang on. Yeah, it took both of us to really Initially. effectively hang on. And it was at that point that we had gone through several scenarios. So initially I thought it was maybe the autopilot engaged um, and that it was starting a descent. So I clicked the autopilot button. That's in the very beginning. After that we thought maybe it was some sort of weird runaway nose up trim or sorry, nose down trim. I thought it was a runaway nose down trim. Um, but then we looked at the indicator and it's indicating we've got it nose up. So um, we still went to troubleshoot that. Ian looked for a checklist, looked for a, a breaker, which there isn't one. It's actually connected to the autopilot. Uh, it's the autopilot breaker that disconnects the electric trim. And um, then finally, uh, turning downwind to, you know, basically squaring off our base turn, um, light bulb went off. I was like, 
Okay, we've got it full nose up trim. Um, the elevator doesn't appear to be damaged. We're able to sort of inspect it from the uh, back window, the aft window of the airplane. And we're kind of out of options. It's like, well, we can keep trying things, um, but we don't you know, have really a good list of things to try. There's no real procedure for this. So um, light bulb went off. Like, well, they re-rigged the airplane. They re-rigged the trim. Um, the mechanic had done a very good job centering all of the, the trim tabs up on the airplane. And so um, I started to very slowly, incrementally trim it nose down, which is counterintuitive. Um, and slowly, the airplane started to regain, you know, a trimmed, a stabilized, trimmed descent. And we were able to make a normal landing, um, rolled out, exited the runway, and uh, the fire trucks and the emergency vehicles followed us back to the ramp. Um, and everything worked out. My name's uh, Stephen James Fletcher, Jr. Uh, I've been a AMP mechanic for 24 years. When I, when I heard that I had misrigged it, I was in disbelief. Uh, the pilot had come in and told me what had happened and he declared an emergency. Um, instantly, I got this numbness feeling. Uh, it was like, there's no way that that happened. And I had this feeling even with a aircraft that wasn't damaged, that taxied back fine, and crew pilots, nobody got hurt, and I still had this, this feeling. After I realized that the problem was opposite trim control, uh, we brought the airplane in. I instantly wanted to find out what the problem was because I, I still couldn't believe that it was mistrimmed. So I started opening up all the panels, everything that I had uh, had access to prior to when I changed it. and. Initially, I could not find where the problem was, but it was definitely opposite trim. Um, finally, somebody had a bright enough flashlight and the right angle mirror, and we saw where the control cables had done a 180 when they were put on the actuator. Um, then I realized where exactly the mistake was. I have heard of stories of airplanes, uh, the elevator trim tabs being misrigged. Um, I've heard where the aircraft has crashed. Um, pilots have told me these stories. You hear it quite often. Never thought that I would have missed it. Uh, even knowing that I've heard those stories prior to my mistake, it, you know, it's you, you listen to the stories and, and you try to absorb what was missed and, and learn from those. Um, and in my head, I, I knew that it happens, uh, people miss them, and I'm not going to make that mistake. You know? And that step was missed. In this situation, tragedy was averted. At the NTSB, we've investigated numerous accidents involving misrigging of elevator trim cables during maintenance. One of those accidents occurred right here on the bank of the Missouri River when a Hansa 320 business jet crashed with a misrigged elevator trim tab, killing both pilots on board. The consequence of elevator trim cable misrigging is that when the pilot flies nose up trim, the elevator trim system applies nose down trim. These reverse controls presents a very confusing situation to the pilot, which has resulted in tragedy. In another accident I investigated, a Convair 580 cargo airplane had just undergone a phase maintenance inspection that required that the elevator cables be disconnected. When the cables are reattached, they are misrigged and the elevator trim had reverse control. The mechanics were highly experienced and professional, but they failed to rig the cables properly, and the redundant safety control checks did not identify the mistake. The captain and first officer were highly experienced pilots having over 16,000 and 19,000 hours of flight time respectively, and both having significant flight hours in the Convair airplanes. From the time the first officer called rotate until impact, the pilot repeated the word pull 27 times. In all the situations discussed here, the mechanics and the pilots both failed to recognize when the elevator trim cables were misrigged. During a post-maintenance check flight, what can mechanics and pilots do to reduce the risk of not recognizing when the flight controls are misrigged. 
A colleague of mine conducted a similar investigation, and she'll offer her insights concerning that question. Recently, within a 20-month period, the NTSB investigated not only the incident that you just heard about, but also three accidents involving aircraft with misrigged flight controls. I investigated an accident in Anchorage, Alaska, in which the pilot was killed when his Piper PA-12 crashed during takeoff. We found out very early in the investigation what had happened. The elevator had been misrigged such that the pilot's control inputs produced opposite reaction on the elevator. I met with the family within days of the accident to give them the bad news about what had happened. They too felt it was important to raise awareness about this important safety issue. Do you know which direction your flight controls should move in response to your control inputs? How about the trim tabs? Both pilots and mechanics play a crucial role in preventing this type of accident. Mechanics can become familiar with the normal directional movement of the controls and surfaces before disassembling the systems. Carefully follow manufacturer's instructions to ensure that the work is completed as specified. Always refer to up-to-date instructions and manuals when performing a task. Some maintenance information, especially for older airplanes, may be nonspecific. Ask questions of another qualified person if something is unfamiliar to you. Strive to eliminate the common factors that can lead to human error. Fatigue, distraction, stress, complacency, and pressure to get the job done are just a few. Learn about and adhere to sound risk management practices to help prevent common errors. Ensure that the aircraft owner or pilot is thoroughly briefed about the work that has been performed. This may prompt them to thoroughly check the system during pre-flight or help them successfully troubleshoot if an in-flight problem occurs. Pilot scan. Become familiar with the normal directional movement of the flight controls and trim surface of the aircraft that you fly now before it undergoes maintenance. It is easier to recognize abnormal if you are already familiar with what normal looks like. After maintenance, check systems more thoroughly than the normal pre-flight checklist implies. For example, if a pre-flight checklist states trim set for takeoff, verify not only the trim setting, but also proper directional travel. Avoid interruptions and distractions during your pre-flight inspection to ensure that you do not skip or misevaluate the items that you're checking. Be prepared to abort the takeoff if something doesn't seem right. After going through this experience, I would tell other mechanics in the fields, uh, shops, to just concentrate more on, on the safety side of it, uh, slow down, really go through each procedure that's in the maintenance manual. The maintenance manual's there as, as it's like the Bible, uh, as far as step by step. We wanted to participate in this uh, safety video because we had a bad experience that turned out okay, um, that's preventable. And um, it wasn't something that we were really educated on at all. Sort of a thing, well, if you have a flight control issue, then good luck. Um, so our incident is now being turned into something positive and it's, a, it's an educational thing. So I think anytime you can turn something that was a negative into a positive and help other people learn from it, you know, there's no reason not to do it.